Hello and welcome to the Life After Diets podcast. I'm Sarah Dosanj, psychotherapist and author of the book, I Can't Stop Eating. And I'm Stephanie Michelle, binge recovery health coach. If you feel out of control around food, we get it because we've been there. Thank you for joining our conversations about how to make peace with food and feel more comfortable in our bodies. Now on to this week's episode. What have you failed at lately? Define failure. (laughs) What have I failed at? I don't know. I think it's been a long time since I've really thought of things in that term. I used to feel like I just was. That's what I was. I was a failure. I'd failed at life. I'd failed at everything, really. Failed at even being able to feed myself for the longest time. It was interesting when you asked that question, my mind went black. There was nothing that came to mind, which isn't to say that I'm I'm winning at everything I do. I don't know if I perceive it as right. as failure in the same way as I did before. Failure or well, failing to me suggests that there is a very clear line and over the line you pass and on this side of the line you fail, like with a test or an exam. And I can see your 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 arm moving, so I'm guessing that you are googling the word <laughs> failing. I, I am, mm. um, but I also, as you were talking, was thinking that to me, I think what I would consider failure was was um, it was self defined rather than externally defined. If I disappointed myself, or if I couldn't do something I perceived that I should be able to do, that was a failure, even if someone else wouldn't have considered it a failure or if somebody else's definition of a failure was not what I perceived to be a failure. But technically, according to the U.S. dictionary anyway, uh, <laughs> they define it by what it's not. They call it a lack of success. <laughs> which oh. I can't, or the omission of expected or required action. That's the absence of something rather than the presence of something. Okay. Interestingly. Well, let's have a look at the UK one and just see if it's... Uh... See if it's any different. We have lack of success as well, and the neglect or omission of expected or required action. Yeah, that's what mine said. Yeah, yeah. I think that's why numbers can be so appealing because you can decide where success lies and know whether you've been successful or not from a weight or calorie perspective, whatever it is that you're measuring. And the other is exactly what you say: that internal measurement. And I suppose like the other week when you were talking about spending quality time with your kids, but that being hard to define, Mm. the sense of whether you feel like you're failing at that or not could be really arbitrary, especially if you're putting that pressure on yourself. Yes. And this is why I think we need both external and internal measures, because I can think of a number of people for whom an external measurement, like a number, and there's a lot of gratification that comes from achieving it or a lot of sense of failure that comes from not. Whereas that internal measurement can, I think I've heard a lot of people say, if it's internally defined, then we can make excuses for ourselves. Well, for me, it just feels very black and white. So when you said then the example being, I failed at spending quality time with my kids, I think how my mind would go now with things that I feel like I failed at is that the voice in my head is much softer and it would be more like, um, could have done that better, you know? (laughs) Just a little bit matter of fact, and that's not great. And it's okay to not feel great about that thing. Mm -hmm. Um, It feels less personal. It feels less about who I am. It feels less tied to my worth as a human being, I think, these days. Same. Um, What's coming to my mind is triggerability. I guess the closest I come to feeling like a failure I don't call myself I don't talk to myself that way anymore so it is hard to speak on um but the closest I would come to feeling like that is in those moments where I feel hijacked by my system which typically shows up around my patience level with my kids or sometimes it shows up when I'm talking to my family members uh like my dad or my dad (laughs) um (laughs) I love my dad, but yes, there's this trigger ability and I will breach my own boundary. I will breach my own ability to stay centered and in myself. And this used to be this very same mechanism by which binging used to happen. It was, it's the same thing, different story um, where something in me gets <gasps> looped into something and I cannot stay in myself. And I, and I start to spiral through and I, and I start to re- react versus respond. And with binging, it was the same. I would think about this 
all the time and I would have the best of, and I was like, don't, that's the moment to stop doing it. And that, that's such an important moment right there. Pause, pause, pause. It's the same thing I do now where I'm like, when you feel activated, pause, pause, pause. And it's so hard. And I feel like that, that to me is the hardest one to deal with because it feels like it just happens which I suppose might lend itself to feeling like less of a failure because it doesn't even feel like it's in your control, but it is, I suppose. And so there is this sense of like, darn it, it happened so fast, I did it again. I don't even know how I'd go about like how, I guess the feeling of failure comes from, I focus on this so much. I I really think about it. I put a lot of effort into making something happen or not happen. And yet every time it goes the other way. And that's what's frustrating because- how much more work can you do on something you already work on so much? You know, what? where do we go now? It's the self-acceptance part, isn't it? Do you feel, though, I'm guessing that in the moment when you're still feeling activated and you're seeing what's going on, but you're still activated, are you not more likely to feel like a failure, that you failed at something, that it's there in the moment than when you're talking about it here, for example? Does the level of how you perceive success lack of success at maintaining the, the system maintaining itself in that moment vary depending on how close you are to that event or not um yes because i'm talking about it now and feeling less energy attached to it i don't feel like a failure whereas in those moments i would be closer to feeling like a failure um because i'm so activated it's part of the activation then yes 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 also in the moment, it feels very black and white and catastrophic. It feels like I'm a, oh, I can't. Yes, your, your thoughts go there. Whereas now I am able to recognize that <laughs> maybe to the naked eye, I'm still failing largely at patience. But I know that I actually have been making progress and there have been more moments of pause over years. It's not fast, <laughs> but it is a bit. And I have that perspective at the moment, whereas in the moment, I'm like, it's all that same. Like, <laughs> like <you're> still, <laughs> no one can tell the difference, but I can. And and I I also have hope and trust in this process. And I don't I'm not giving I don't give up on it. And that to me is also not failure. You know what I mean? Like the fact that I'm still showing up, trying all the time. This presence of self in this process and the continual work towards it, to me, feels not like a failure. If I were to say, forget it forget it. Actually, that's not even true because there have been times where I've said, you know what? This is just me. This is just how I am. And this, <laughs> it's part of that is actually part of self-acceptance and has alleviated some of the burden anyway. But um, failure to me is is giving up on self. It's not even the, the act. You know, maybe there is a part of me that's like, you know what? This is how I am. And this is, I'm going to accept that. But that's a self-acceptance. And, and, I think the self-abandonment is the failure in my experience and to my eyes. Okay. So when you're not patient and this kind of comes in this sense of I'm failing at this being patient thing, would being impatient be an issue if you're just being impatient with yourself or is it only perceived to be a problem if other people are impacted by it? Not for me. It would be a problem if it was with myself too. So it's, it feels it's more than the patience or impatience. This is about the impact that you have on others. And then, of course, how you feel about the impact that you're having on others. What do you mean? I suppose you were describing this idea about whether you're patient and you're, or you're impatient as success if you're patient and failure if you're impatient. But actually, patience and impatience doesn't matter that much to you, only in as much as it impacts somebody else. Or myself. Oh, that's what I was asking. And oh, no. I you went oh, the I and then I. If it yeah, was sorry, just I, you in that. If, no, if no. you were the only person experiencing your impatience and you're on your own, so no one else is experiencing it. Is it, is it as much of a failing to you as yes. when you feel like you're impatient uh, with others? As much, no, mm -hmm. but it is still. Good. Yes, I can say I don't like the feeling of it. Yeah. Even if it's just for myself, it feels like it because it feels like something's gotten a hold of me. And I'm not the one in control. Mm -hmm. uh, and that feels that I guess it's more re related to that feeling of of not being in control of myself or of things that feels like the failing. Mm -hmm. Well, one big shift for me in recovery, I think, and a massive one, really, really important, was that I 
I got to a point where I no longer saw binging as a failure. And that shifted everything because it got rid of that catastrophic reaction that happens, not just after a binge, but also in the lead up to a binge, because I, I think that binging is failing at that time. The, the emotional reactivity to the binge urge itself, or even just to the urge, the urge to eat and maybe be really hungry and want to eat a lot, was what kept knocking me off course. That wasn't me saying every time I binge, oh, it doesn't matter. It did matter. It didn't feel great. It was something that I still wanted to work on and change, but it just didn't become catastrophic. And I think that was because I started to have more compassion. I could see reasons for it. And I think I really grasped that this appetite of ours is such a primal, primal thing and it's powerful. And for years, I always thought that my will, my willpower right. and my discipline should be able to override that. And the fact that I couldn't, was a failing that was the thing that I held to be true for a long time and when that was less true then I could actually get a have a have a better relationship with my appetite yes I feel exactly the same that that piece of recognizing the power of appetite took I couldn't consider it a failure anymore I did consider it an incredible frustration <laughs> and I would get angry but it wasn't mine like I didn't, I didn't have the personal responsibility attached to it so much. I mean, is that all people need to do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think we can wrap this up as a, as a shorter episode. Well, it is that whole, it's that really uncomfortable, unpleasant cycle of feeling like you're doing really well and then chaos with food or how you're feeling about your body coming back and feeling like it was all for me, it was always, I felt like I had been deluding myself whenever I was back in the chaos, that any time I had not been in the chaos, just, just didn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. To me, it comes back to that control. I felt like I had had control and then I lost control. And that to me was this failure. Again, control is clearly a theme for me. But but what I see this, where I see this coming up a little more often is in um, where people have said, I I have learned so much. I have all these tools in my toolbox and then I don't use them. And that being the failure, like I know all this stuff, but I don't put any of it to use. And I could. That's where I think people. Well, it's not, it's not the only place. Of course, I had the binge itself could be the failure for sure for many people. But sometimes it's just the, the, the binge in addition to the fact that I didn't even try or I didn't even I didn't even implement the things that I've been learning about, even though they make sense to me off, you know, outside of a binge. The question I ask in those situations is where's the conflict? Because if we're unconflicted about something, we just do it. It's easy. It's not a problem. If we were, I don't know, just plucking one out of thin air, journaling. If we feel unconflicted about making time and sitting down and putting our thoughts and feelings on the page, we'll do it. So there's a conflict somewhere. That's, I think, if we, if we look for those conflicts, we can start to understand something about ourselves. But instead, the pattern for many is to go to, oh, I'm not, I'm not trying hard enough, or I'm lazy, or I'm undisciplined, or any other yeah. number of reasons well, what are the reasons that one would not use a tool at a time when they would otherwise want to be using a tool why would the failure so to speak exist i think if we took something like journaling that just sounds like oh you just sit down and you just write your thoughts and feelings out stopping getting still and noticing what is going on in your thoughts and feelings can be incredibly activating, especially if there's a lot there that hasn't been acknowledged. It's like mindful eating, right? That sounds like such a simple thing to do. Just be present and pay attention and listen to your body when you're eating. But many people, when they try to do that, it is it can be excruciating, but there's so much judgment because it shouldn't be excruciating. Mm. It should just be a really simple thing. It sounds really simple. And I guess it's understanding the activation that there's something being activated in doing these things. And I think for some people as well, another conflict for many is I'm seeing this more and more frequently at the moment, this, you know, how themes kind of come around is people struggling to make themselves a priority. I can maybe give something to me once I've given everything out to everybody else first. 
and, and there's no way of satisfying everybody in those moments too. I think that can be another source of conflict for people too. Those are just a few. I think there are loads more. Sure. That can also be a habit. Like we get caught up in our habit cycles or our automatic responses and forget or can't or just it doesn't it's not easy to interject something new and different and the tool or whatever it might be or you know acting in our own best interest isn't the default and when we're activated which is in these times where this failure and success is so fraught implementing these things is not it's not easy <laughs> repeatedly like it, it's really hard to to insert a new behavior or in a moment where all the defenses are up and things are moving really fast. You know what I mean? I think we underestimate how hard that actually is. But I also remember feeling like, oh, no, I fully recognized and thought of the tool and didn't do it. You know what I mean? It's like I'm a jerk because I'm the one that I, like I had. It was all right there for me, but I just didn't. And that feels like the feeling. And I think that goes back to like. Well, there's probably. For me, a lot of that was the it was like, well, that's because I'm up against a primal appetite hijacking. And that is huge. That's way bigger than my desire to use a tool right now because it almost feels like a survival mechanism of my body. So the amount of influence we have over ourselves against an appetite thing, I think if we're talking specifically about that, can't be underestimated. And I'm curious to hear what you have to say about that because for me, there was restriction in my blood. So it was like... That was really a primal thing. What about emotional binges where it's not necessarily such a primal force of restriction acting through it? You know what I mean? That there is maybe more perception that we should be able to control that. Yeah. So many times I would be wanting to or telling myself I need to practice that pause and that checking in before the binge. And like you, in the moment, sometimes it would occur to me and I would just go, I don't care. I don't want to. I don't, I don't, I just right now, I don't care. I'll do it next time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I realized, I think one of the big conflicts for me around that was I thought that if I stopped and if I looked at what was going on and how I was feeling, then that would somehow mean that I, I couldn't binge. Right. Or I couldn't have the food. Sometimes almost I almost didn't want the urge to just go away. I wanted to try to satisfy the urge as well. So even the prospect of the urge going away, part of me in that moment, because I already wanted the food, is like, no, I just want the food. I can't imagine the desire for the food going away. Yeah, right. And that's why when I stopped catastrophizing binge eating so much, I would have to in those moments where I really hit that resistance going, I can still have the food and mean it. You can't trick yourself with this stuff. Yeah. You might get away with it once or twice, but your brain will learn. And the part that in that moment wants the food knows that if you pause, you're you're trying to stop it from, you know, playing playing this through to the end as such. That that was a big one. It's like I can still do this. And I'm trying to think how I got there because for a long time I really did not like myself at all. But there was again like a stage, probably more further into my recovery, where I actually really wanted to know what was going on for me above and beyond whether that meant I stopped binging or not. I just wanted to make some sense of something. I felt like I was on a quest for truth. Mm. And truth felt more important than whether I binged or not. That's deep. Yeah, wasn't it? A quest for truth. Yeah. What's yeah. your truth, Sarah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, I come back to the whole everything's true and nothing's true. So you can find truth in everything and you can find not truth in everything. Probably, at least on this yeah. material plane. I think I think like the idea of food is a little different from others. Like failure around food is a bit different to me than than other others because um there is that I think when you're in that hijacked place, it's just so darn hard. And I don't I really truly don't expect I wouldn't expect myself to be able to to come out of that and with easily at all. But what about failure in other areas where it's not necessarily something you're up against physiologically? If we moved it to body image then and yeah. away from appetite and primal yeah. drives, this is a scenario then that I'm sure you've worked with people in. Event coming up, they don't want to go, not feeling great in their bodies at all, trying to do the work around about how they can make themselves feel okay to go to the event, how can they look after themselves, and in the end they decide, not to go to the event. Mm. I think that can feel like one as well. Like if your body image stops you from doing something, yeah, 
it can feel like you failed, especially when you're trying to do this work. And that I think is that real personal measurement then of whether you failed or not, because it's not a success or a failure, whether you go or not. You've been talking about this. You've been curious. You've been trying to understand this. You've been feeling some of these feelings and okay, you haven't got to the point where you felt able to go, but that again, doesn't just completely cancel out all the work that you've been doing. Yeah. There's something inherent in that that speaks to the amount that you're up against, right? Like the decision to not go isn't made lightly. I think it's something that you have to feel a great amount of fear or shame in order to be making that decision to not go. And I, I think it's the compassion element again of if you're choosing to not go despite your best efforts, there must be a large amount of pain there. And to me, that's like, oh, you know, not, not, oh. Of course, if it's self, it's a lot harder. It's easier. When I'm thinking of this, I'm picturing people. And now I'm trying to put myself back in to, because it's going to be so much harder for me to offer that to myself than it would be for me to offer it to someone else. I think that we, again, underestimate the level of, of what happens to us when we are activated and how the brain is just seeking safety and it's just going to go right to what it knows. It's not up to new challenges and stretching out of our comfort zone when it feels threatened. So a lot of times we talk about so much of the work being outside of the moments and the time element here. We are so quick to assume how long this all should take and, you know, how long we've been working on something and it should be working. It shouldn't, I shouldn't still be doing this. And to my mind, this always takes longer than, not always, but it it, it can take longer than seems right or seems reasonable. I feel like how you respond to yourself when you feel like you've failed, that is part of the work. So I've talked about this in my in my videos and I've done, I think, a couple of reels on it as well. And that is the idea of thinking ahead of time. How do you want to respond or show up for yourself when you feel like you failed, when you fall short of your own expectations? I think there's something around anticipating that so that when it happens, it doesn't mean it's going to remove all those feelings, but at least part of you can go, okay, I knew this was going to happen. I knew I was going to feel like this at some point. How is it I was going to respond to myself? Mm. It might be a lot of, to begin with, a lot of naming. It's not necessarily rushing in and trying to reassure yourself, but it's the naming and it's the grounding, the acknowledgement of, okay, I feel like I have royally effed up, but I knew that I was going to feel like this. I've spent some time thinking about this moment. Yeah, I've even had people write letters to themselves for them to read in those moments. Mm -hmm. Tried to encourage people to record videos to themselves because, you know, I like that. People seem really reluctant with that for some reason. <laughs> it's looking at yourself. Yeah, I know. I know, but it's you talking to you. And I love that. I love something about that, of seeing mm -hmm. me talking back at me, knowing how I was going to feel. Like that there's somebody there, even though it's another part of me that knows me well enough to know I was going to feel like this and that this is what I needed to hear in this moment. If you want connection and support around any of the topics we talk about on the podcast, we would love for you to join our membership community. Members have access to monthly online support groups, a private Facebook group, live episode recordings, and member-only Q&As. If you would like to join us, please head to lifeafterdietspodcast.com forward slash community. Now let's get back to the episode. One of the tools, tools, one of the I don't know, changes, shifts that I, I think I made around failure was understanding that accepting or or not seeing something as a as a failing did not mean I had to be calm and happy. It I still have moments where I where something disappointing happens or some I don't I'm not doing something that I would never say I'm the failure or I failed, but I still feel really disappointed or frustrated that it that it went down the way it did and i fully embrace that it's it's kind of like rather than taking that energy and emotion and turning it inward i just turn it outward <laughs> it's like oh, it's so frustrating that this happens it bothers me i feel charged about it and that's fine i think that i need to do that to process that's uncomfortable it's just a matter of not then making it about me you know what i mean i'm not personalizing that emotion but I'm allowed to feel it. And I think having permission to feel the about it can be productive, actually. But when it turns back on oneself, that's where it turns into shame and, and hopelessness. That can really take you down. But, you know, 
I, I think it's important to note that because for me, it was more of a shift of where the energy was going, not an app, not a not a decrease in the energy that was there. When you were talking about it there, and you're talking about feeling disappointed or frustrated with yourself, like I can recognize those emotions. I think when you asked me the question at the beginning of the episode, what have I failed at recently? Like the language didn't, sure. didn't resonate. But in terms of sort of frustration and disappointment with myself, I will sometimes notice myself having an emotional reaction, like whatever that might be, irritation. Um, it tends to be if I feel like annoyed or angry or irritated, when I catch myself doing that, I'm like, oh, no, no, I don't. I, this is not that I think there is a little piece of judgment that comes in every time. But I, I talk myself down from that and I remind myself like it's it's OK. Like, there's something going on. Something's been activated. It's fine. This emotion doesn't mean anything about you. But I remind myself of that because I think it's an emotional overreaction, a flash of judgment and then talking myself down. I think that's the kind of cycle that I go through now. And the, the judgment and the talking myself down kind of happens quite automatically now. It's not oh, I'm just doing a great job of remembering to talk myself down. That part feels like it's um, maybe, I don't know, is it habitual? Maybe even, I'm mm. not quite sure if it's quite at that level, but it it feels like I remember, I remember, oh, this doesn't have to mean what I'm making it mean in this moment. Yeah. But I, the judgment happens, the judgment happens yeah. like that. I can't just block that from happening. Right, same. The other place where I think failure can come up or the feeling of failure can come up is around where there is a conflict between our intellectual understanding versus the embodied, more felt emotional one. So for example, um, feeling like on, a, in, on an intellectual level, the value system around not judging other people's bodies, not judging our bodies, what body neutrality is and acceptance and, you know, might be intellectually firm, but then there is a feeling that sometimes happens where we make a snap judgment about ourselves or about someone else or about a body and the feeling of guilt, like oh, I'm failing at this, um, at my values. I'm failing at body neutrality or, you know, like these or, or anti-diet or whatever it might be that this, the conflict between the intellect and the emotion. And I think we're really quick to assume that because we have a feeling, because we're human, that that is some kind of breach of our own value system. I think this is one of those DBT and instead of or situations where it's completely okay to have a thought, for example, of I think I, I, this this event's coming up, I want to lose weight, where you've been working so hard at, you know, not doing that, but all of a sudden this feeling is there and you want you you feel like you want to lose weight. That's a thought that came up because you're a human being and it's a feeling that came up because you're a human being. And it's okay that those are there and you're still allowed to own your value system and pursue your value system, even as you might doubt it, or even as you might have a conflicting value system suddenly come on in. Because I, I don't believe that we we are all something, you know, we're not one single part. We have so many parts of ourselves and so many times where vulnerabilities might come in and suggest something else to us that it's like making space for all of that rather than being like, well, I did this thing, so I'm failing at this. It's like, no, there's just parts of you and it's totally okay. <laughs> you know, I think there's such a relief in seeing ourselves as more complex humans and that we can make room for all those parts to be there. And then to decide what, you know, behavior is a different thing than thoughts as well. Um, but even where a behavior might be in conflict with our value system, it's represent representing a part of us that may have ir irreconciled emotions about something or perhaps just different interests and different um contexts i think of those situations where i come back to in my mind is that there's two steps as i think about it. this is what i found works anyway and step one is to just honor the feeling whatever it is and by honor the, honoring the feeling i mean naming uh allowing it to be there to have space and accepting because the judgment for me anyway sometimes i uh, that judgment will come in about how i'm feeling and then the second part is question the story, which isn't, and this is where this is quite nuanced in how I, how I think about it and how I do it in my own life, is that is not rationalize the feeling away. That's why the feeling has to be honored and accepted first, because if I just try to rationalize my feelings away, 
I'm just brushing over something that's still that's still there. And um, there's a an analogy in transactional analysis where that's the idea of a, of a tower of pennies. And if you have like a crooked penny and that all the pennies get put on top of the crooked penny, like eventually it tops over, yeah. all the pennies need to be smoothed out. And it's like a crooked penny, an emotion that is really tried to just try and shove it down and go like, no, 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 I mustn't feel like this. This is unreasonable. I should be grateful. I should be feeling this. I should be feeling that, um, whatever that might be. I had an incident this last week where I had to deal with a call center and I was trying to get an issue resolved, which took five calls on five separate days to sort out. And then I'd phone up and they would say, I'm not even going to go into it because I'll probably get myself all worked up again. <laughs> but by, <laughs> by the last phone call, or the penultimate phone call, I should say, before it had been resolved, I was so worked up. But I'm trying, because I'm talking to a different person each time as well, and I don't want to take anything out on any one individual. And I am trying to, like, hold it all in, and I feel like I'm about to burst, and I'm trying to keep my voice even, and I'm trying, and I, but I can feel it coming out in the way I'm saying it. And there was so much going on. It was this kind of turmoil. And I remember I just got off the phone, and I was like, I, was like, I am so angry. And I remember just saying, like, I am so angry. And I just, I named it. And I noticed the judgment coming in, you know, that I shouldn't be this worked up and it's not fair to be this angry with one person that they haven't been dealing with the whole thing. This is a wider problem with the company, blah, blah, blah. And then I did, I sort of talked myself down and I, I kind of went to, first of all, okay, I'm so angry. Oh, how does it feel? This is really uncomfortable. And then I'm like, what is it I'm really believing about this issue? And I'd catastrophized this issue in my mind you know, because it was about getting my medication. So in my mind, I was mm. thinking, I'm not going to get my medication. I'm going to feel horrendous. Three months down the line, I still won't have my medication and my health will deteriorate. Do you see what it was all that catastrophic yes. thinking? Yes. And when I pulled it back in and just went, okay, what is it that's really going on here? What are, what are the things that I'm believing? And there's also something about fairness and competency and people doing what they said they would do and people fobbing me off and lying to me. There was so much in it. Um. Not quite sure what the conclusion of this is. I suppose I'm just Wait, naming well, the moment I had. But what was the perception of failure? That I had got as worked up as I did about so this So fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. I thought so. Because I mm -hmm. didn't even understand where you're going. Like, to me, I'm thinking, what, what's the problem here? <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't get it. Did I miss a part of the story? And yeah. I think it just speaks to the difference. Because my, do you know, that same story for me would have been the not saying, the not saying I was angry because to me that is a, of course you're getting upset. And, and it's kind of like the failure for me would have been to, to just say, okay, thanks. Bye. And to not say actually, and to speak up for what I needed, um, that I would have perceived that part as the failure, but certainly not the emotion. Yeah. Well, I was, I was speaking up. There was nothing passive about the conversation, but I was I was so conscious that if I got too annoyed with this person, really, if you want someone to help you and sort a problem out, it, yeah, the way I've kind of learned is that anger is not the way to do it. Sometimes yeah, yeah, it will be, sure. but like in, in other situations. So there's this whole trying to rein in this, this inferno that was in me. And that's the angriest I've been, I don't know, yeah. maybe for a year. <laughs> I was really angry. Wow. Well, that's, that's, again, the difference between having an emotion, like the difference between anger and aggression. You know what I mean? The line there, like having the emotion to me is completely reasonable, but it's more like, what might I do with this emotion? You know, might yeah. this be, turn into something more aggressive? Yeah. Or... And it was probably threatening to my identity as well, because I'll say I'm not an angry person. You yeah. know, I, I make it like an identity statement. I, I am not this as if experiencing anger then makes you an angry person. Yeah. You know. <laughs> we're so different <laughs> <laughs> i'm waiting exactly. i sometimes think because when you talk about anger i sometimes think i wonder how many times she's been angry with me and hasn't been able to say it oh no i, I would it? say it you would know because i would i uh, though yeah <laughs> not because <laughs> i i would i wouldn't come at you mm. but you i cannot hide it yeah uh, you would you would feel a difference in my energy. You would feel me being short and curt, and um, I would I would detach mm. from you a bit. Mm. 
but, but I might that's also not, do that. That's not you verbalizing or speaking up for what you want or what's I know. going on. That's my, that's my failure. Mm-hmm. I don't always. I mm-hmm. feel, and I don't mind that I feel, but why can't I say it? You know, like, why, why do I not address it? That's, that's my thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'll just withdraw. Yeah. And I'll just, I'll, I'll completely, I'll put up a wall, but I won't say it. <laughs> Uh, so what do I do in that situation do I come and find you if you withdraw do I come and find you you say Steph are you angry with me and then my barrier will come down and I'll say say, yes I am angry (laughs) because if I'm angry at you I perceive that you've left me first like if I'm angry with you it's because I feel like whatever has made me angry is a barrier between us and that's why I leave because I'm like well then she doesn't value me so I'm not going to value her. I'm, I'm out. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting because mine would be more, I suppose, and something I've noticed in my pattern is I would have a thing where if someone pulls away from me, I'm pulling away too. Right. And that's something I've actually done a lot of work on in therapy. And there have been a few scenarios where I felt like someone's pulling away and I've stepped forward and I've done it. And it's so rewarding when you do. <laughs> <laughs> because even I- if they are actually pulling away, when you step forward, if they step back again, it's like, well, at least I know I'm not just yeah. projecting something yeah. in my mind that's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Because I sometimes think, oh, I go on to Steph about how, you know, I don't do well with anger. And I'm like, maybe she thinks like if she was angry, she couldn't say it to me because she think I wouldn't be able to hack it. <laughs> no, I feel like if you were angry at me, I wouldn't know. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I would, I would, um, I would work through it. Yeah, I think I, think I wouldn't, would. I wouldn't let myself stay angry. I would work through it because. Yeah, because it's such an uncomfortable place for me to be. When I've felt that slash of anger or annoyance with somebody, I I acknowledge it to myself, but I work through it and I really check out um, the story. Because most of the time, when you really pull the story in and what you're believing, or I'm believing, it's, it's, you know, don't want to make sweeping statements about everyone. There's normally a whole load of like my pattern and old stuff from the past coming in. If somebody does something in the moment that is just legitimately something to be angry about that's clearer that's easier yeah 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 I can understand that yeah okay yeah yeah okay yeah yeah bye okay well we hope we've cleared up all of your failures and that you never feel badly again yeah but if you do and you're feeling quite critical of yourself you might want to come to New York on the 6th of May and hang out with us there because we're going to do some work on the inner critic in person with our listeners. We would love for you to join us if you're able to be in New York at that time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I thought you were going to do your podcast voice about the link below. <laughs> oh. oh, right, right. Okay. If you want to join us, find us. At, if you want if you want to join us. If you, I'm going to leave are, all of that in. <laughs> if you want... Oh, God. If you want to join us, why is it so hard to say? If you want to join us, you can find the links below. (laughs) (laughs) You were getting kind of annoyed there, Steph. Were you angry? I thought you were smiling at this simple delivery. All right. Thanks for listening. See you, Steph. Bye-bye.